ResNets, or residual networks, were a significant step forward in architecture design and ResNets remain popular until to this day. We will look at uh, some of the initial design ideas for ResNets uh, using the example graphs shown on the next slide. We'll start first by looking at the graph on the left side of the slide. Here we see some typical training progress when training a network over time. So on the x-axis we see the number of iterations and on the y-axis we see the error. And what we would like to see is that the error gets reduced as the training progresses. And uh, when we look at this cyan um, line, this is shows the training progress of a traditional 18-layer neural network. And traditional here means uh, traditional before ResNets or other architecture advances came into play. Also from this curve, we see the typical jumps that come from uh, reducing the learning rate. But what was observed up until to this point is that if uh, networks were made deeper, the uh, performance would only improve up to a certain point. So in this example here, we see that uh, this 18-layer network uh, provides a baseline, and then making it deeper, we see the red curve shows the 34-layer network by comparison. And this 34-layer network, it does worse in the beginning, but it pretty much stays worse and it stays uh, above the cyan line all throughout training. And this is uh, quite disappointing and also quite counterintuitive. In the abstract sense, one could make an argument that a deeper network should not do any worse than a more shallow network. The deeper network has more capacity and in some sense we could say that in the worst case the extra layers are not used and should simply do nothing. And with doing no nothing we mean just learn the identity function. So um, looking at this graph on the left though uh, what people observed is that in practice this doesn't really happen. And in practice, deeper networks, they have worse performance. And so this hints towards a problem during training. So while the network should do better, the optimization algorithm isn't really able to find a configuration for the deeper network that in fact is also better. So then one design idea proposed by ResNets is to introduce shortcuts so that uh, that will help the gradient flow. Now again, this is somewhat an intuitive and uh, abstract argument, but it just helps maybe to illustrate the design ideas that people had when they designed the networks. And it's uh, not necessarily said that uh, this idea is really what uh, contributes to the success. So a similar argument though has been made for LSTMs where these uh, shortcut connections also seem to improve the gradient flow. And so ResNets do the same thing. And if you look at the ResNet architecture and the ResNet building blocks, what you will see is that uh, by these shortcuts and by adding tensors from previous layers to the output of other layers, in fact, the ResNet is learning differences to the identity function. So the ResNet gives the network the chance to simply propagate the identity function, that means this doing nothing, and then has multiple network layers that uh, learn a difference to this identity function. Having said that, a significant improvement that came with ResNets is simply the use of batch normalization. And batch normalization definitely is a big key 
to training deeper networks. With these uh, innovations, what we can see then on the right graph, when ResNets are used, that deeper networks do in fact lead to better performance. So what we see is in cyan, an 18 layer ResNet, and in red, a 34 layer ResNet, and the 34 layer ResNet is in fact better. Seeing that there's an improvement when going from 18 layers to 34 layers, why not go higher and higher and higher? So looking forward a bit, the ResNets that are popular, they have something from 18 layers. This is a very small ResNet, 50 layers. That's uh, a very popular baseline ResNet. And then still 150, 200 layers is also quite popular. But so I would say that 50 to 200 layers is the typical range of number of layers that a ResNet has. That doesn't mean that people didn't try to go to 500,000 or more layers, but uh, there's something like a diminishing return and also still a problem um, training these deep networks, takes a lot of memory and all these other issues. So for now, when thinking about ResNets, uh, I would typically think of about something that's 50 to 200 layers deep. So what we see here is one of the ResNet blocks. Again, uh, as we saw with other uh, types of uh, architecture ideas, then there tend to be multiple versions. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about two ResNet blocks and we acknowledge other variations of these blocks that can be found in the literature. So let's just look at this block. This is called an identity block. This block takes a tensor X as input and it outputs another tensor. So here's the input and then we see two branches. The tensor can travel on the top branch along here and uh, this is the shortcut. So this is also called the shortcut branch that bypasses the computation. And the bottom, this is where the computation happens. This is also called the main path or the main branch. Before looking at what happens down there at the main branch, let's just see how these things are combined. This is the plus function. So what needs to happen is that the main branch creates a tensor that is of the same shape as this uh, input tensor X. And then the input tensor X is added to whatever this computation of the main branch yields. And after that, there is a ReLU nonlinearity. Let's now look at the computation on the main branch. This building block W is either a conf or a fully connected layer. Batch normalization BN and ReLU is the nonlinearity. So these three blocks together are a traditional combination of some computational layer with parameters, batch normalization, and a nonlinearity. Then we have another such triple, either conf or fully connected, batch normalization, and ReLU. Finally, we have a conf or FC layer, another batch normalization, and then the ReLU here comes after the te output tensor is added to this tensor X. That is an input of the ResNet block. One possible design choice to play with here would be the position of the batch normalization layer. 
This here is a conf block. The problem that we need to address is when the computation on the main branch changes the resolution of the tensor. So let's just imagine that one of these uh, blocks here, let's say a convolutional or fully connected layer, uh, will change the resolution by a factor of 2. So the width and height would be divided by 2. Then it is no longer possible to simply add the input tensor x with the output of the computational branch. And therefore, the uh, shortcut branch also needs to have some computation. In this case, it's uh, one computational block w and one batch normalization. And the uh, purpose of this uh, w block here is to match the resolution of the main branch. Otherwise, the main branch looks as we saw it before. So basically what we see here are three traditional, uh, let's, let's, one, one could call you know, one of these things, maybe this is a conf layer. So what we kind of see in this architecture is that for every three conf layers, there is one uh, shortcut. Let's put these uh, two blocks together to form a complete network. In the beginning of the network, we have this uh, traditional idea of a stem that downsamples the network, and this again is some form of a custom design. And then we see again the heavy use of repetition, designing one, or in this case two blocks, and then repeating them. The conf block was there to reduce the resolution, and then we had these identity blocks. And so the identity blocks are repeated multiple times, so maybe two times, uh, before the resolution is reduced again in another conf block. Now, what we see at the end is we have some flatten, flattening going on here, and then we also have a dense layer. Uh, this average pooling uh, is also used to um, reduce the resolution. As we said before, each ResNet block consists of three traditional layers. And one layer here, we count uh, the convolution, the patch normalization, and the nonlinearity. So let's try to count that. All right, so we see one, two, three, four conf blocks, and uh, two, five, ten, twelve identity blocks. So twelve plus four is sixteen, and then when we are up here, that means we have sixteen times three equals forty-eight layers in these ResNet blocks. In addition, we have one conf layer right here and one dense layer at the end. So this gives us ResNet 50. So let's talk about some details of the ResNet architecture. First, there are many different versions of ResNet. Even in the original paper, the authors proposed ResNets of varying depth. So, for example, ResNet 18, ResNet 50, ResNet 152, and I think also one with 200 layers. However, other authors, and probably also the same authors, experimented with different versions of the ResNet architecture. And so, if we talk about ResNet, 
it's not really one particular architecture, it's more like a template for an architecture or for a class of architectures. ResNet won the 2015 ImageNet challenge and it could provide a significant improvement over BGG and GoogleNet. A key thing that makes ResNets work is the batch normalization. The authors propose to use batch normalization after each convolution and before the nonlinear activation function. However, also other versions of ResNet exist. The authors use a batch size of 256 and similar to other papers, the learning rate starts at 0 0.1 and is divided by 10 when the error plateaus. This paper, I think, is the first major successful architecture that does not use any dropout. It, that means there's no dropout layer. Also, this paper proposes the test time augmentation, 10 crop testing. That means that uh, during test time, 10 different crops of an image are tested and the results are aggregated. One noteworthy uh, variation of ResNet has its own name, ResNext. ResNext seems to be a successful variation as some of the highest performing networks, even in recent years, were built on top of this ResNext architecture or they could be called variations of the ResNext architecture. Let's start by looking at the traditional ResNet building block to the left. So this is one particular way to uh, create a ResNet block. What we see here are blocks that are described as number of input channels, then the kernel size of a convolutional filter, here one by one, and then the number of output channels. We know that before, as in other architectures, that this one by one convolution can be used as a dimension reduction layer, or it could also be used as dimension expansion layer as we will see in the third block here. The way this is drawn, we do not see the batch normalization and nonlinear activation function details. These uh, are there, but uh, we'll just uh, not draw them here. Or that means the authors of this particular paper didn't draw them here. So, um, we just need to remember that they are here. So let's look at this block. So a 256 channel tensor comes in and then on the left side we see the main branch and on the right side here we see the shortcut branch. And then uh, these pluses again were in the ResNet architecture the two tensors are added together. So um, this is an identity block. This is a block where the resolution doesn't change, but you can imagine a variation of this where the resolution does change. So the first layer here, the purpose is to use one by one convolution to reduce the number of channels from 256 to 64. Then we perform a 3x3 three three convolution, so we have 64 input channels and the same number as output channels. Finally, in the third layer here, we do 1x1 one one convolution for a dimension expansion, so we have 64 channels as input and 256 channels as output. Now, in ResNext, we're going to modify this architecture by 
somehow splitting up this uh, block into 32 parallel blocks. So the number of parallel blocks in ResNext is of course a hyperparameter you can choose, but in this particular example on the right, we show a version with 32 parallel blocks or what is written here, 32 parallel path. So what we see here is that the 256 input channels are not uh, reduced down to 64, but to four channels only. But then we see the same pattern. Four channels go through a three by three convolution and have four output channels, and then the dimension expansion from four to 256, again with a one by one convolution. So while the number of channels is significantly reduced in these uh, blocks, that means from 64 to four, we now have a lot of these blocks in parallel. In fact, what we said before, we have 32 of these blocks in parallel. The result of all these 32 blocks or path then will be added up. And finally, the result of these addition will again be added similar to the ResNet to the shortcut that goes around here and um, that will be added to the input. These two blocks have roughly the same complexity, the same number of computations. In fact, there are multiple different ways to draw or interpret this res next block. The first interpretation we already saw here, which is uh, labeled A on the left. Let's look at the second interpretation, B. Now we see, as before, the 256 dimensional input tensor here will be sent to 32 different paths. And each path, we see that, as before, 256 channels will be reduced to four by a one by one convolution. Then, as before, we have a three by three convolution on with four channels input and four channels output. But now we are actually going to concatenate all these outputs of the 32 paths, and then we compute one one by one convolution that has 128 channels as input and 256 channels as output. So is this a variation or is this equivalent in its expressive power? This should be an equivalent computation. So it's not probably equivalent computation wise, but it is equivalent in its expressiveness. Because if we look at these um, last blocks here, for example, this one, we go from four channels to 256, but then we add up these 32 different output tensors. And here we concatenate, but then we have one combined uh, block that uh, does this one by one convolution. So we can somehow imagine that in this layer here, each of the uh, path contributes four channels, but each of them can then influence the 256 output channels. And this last uh, block here has then the equivalent effect of um, performing each one by one convolution for each of these paths separately and then adding them up. So 
uh, these two architecture blocks really perform the same uh, expressiveness, comp uh, the expressively, it's the same um, as, as this, even though the computation is just uh, slightly different. So uh, also C is going to be uh, just another version to write it. So what we're going to do is 256 channels will be uh, reduced to 128. And then there will be a group convolution with 32 groups. That means that the 128 channels will be split up into 32 groups of four channels each. And then the groups do not communicate with each other. They only group, uh, they only communicate within channels within the group. So uh, that writing this uh, one uh, group convolution layer is equivalent or is implementing it as a group convolution layer is implementing is equivalent as doing all these separate path. And then at the end, uh, we already saw that uh, this thing here uh, performs something equivalent to uh, what we saw in A and also in B. So if you're not 100% sure of what these variations do, I would recommend to just sit down and think about it a bit to convince yourself that A, B, and C is equivalent. One question is still, why do we use this pattern of dimension reduction, convolution, and dimension expansion? For this, it would help to again convince yourself that performing a 3 by 3 convolution that goes from 256 layers to 256 layers requires a lot more memory and also a lot more computation. The trend to break down costly convolutional layers into cheaper individual convolutions is something that is alive up until today. So looking at the uh, latest architectures, they all used some form of uh, architecture to keep the, the, the cost or the computational cost and the cost in number of parameters of these convolutional blocks low. Now, we'll discuss some aspects of the Inception 2.0 and 3.0 architecture. These, both these architectures were introduced in the same paper, and uh, their ideas are similar. They somehow seem to be more like variations of the same architecture. Again, to make things cheaper, one idea is to factor convolutions. So factoring a 5 by 5 convolution could be done by using two 3 by 3 convolutions. This uses fewer parameters and fewer computations. One design choice is again, should there be a nonlinear layer between two 3 by 3 convolutions? And here experiments suggest that having a nonlinear layer is better than not having a nonlinear layer. So here we see this factorization. As before, we see one branch, one path that had the one by one convolution. We see the branch that did pooling followed by one by one convolution. And we see the branch that did a one by one convolution followed by a three by three convolution. Now, way on the left, this is where we see the branch that had a 1 by 1 convolution and one 5 by 5 convolution is split up now into one 1 by 1 convolution and two 3 by 3 convolutions. The next idea is to factor k times k convolutions 
into k by 1 and 1 by k convolutions. Again, this makes it cheaper. What has been a 3 by 3 convolution here is denoted 1 by n and n by 1, so you could see if you want to do 3 by 3, it would be 1 by 3 and 3 by 1. And here we see what was a, a 5 by 5 convolution is split up into 1 times n, n times 1, and 1 times n, and n times 1. So if you wanted to do exactly the 5 by 5 convolution factored, then what you would have here is 1 by 3 times, and then 3 by 1, then 1 by 3, and again 3 by 1. What we can also do is um, make the architecture wider instead of deeper. Before, we factored convolutions, for example, a 3 by 3 convolution into a 1 by 3 and a 3 by 1 convolution. Let's look at this block here. So previously, this 1 by 3 and 3 by 1 convolution were performed in sequence, making the network deeper, and now they are performed in parallel, and then the, the result is uh, aggregated by filter concatenation. That means channel concatenation. Also, another version here, where if maybe previously 5 by 5 convolution was um, factored into two 3x3 three three convolutions. The first 3x3 three three convolution here stays the same, and the second one is again replaced by this uh, two 1xn and n by one convolutions. In this case, 1x3 and 3x1. Somehow, we can see that these block designs become somewhat arbitrary. It seems uh, that there are several ideas that tell you how to, uh, you know, what building blocks you could use, and then you can try almost any arbitrary combination of these individual building blocks or these individual design ideas. And this is something that neural architecture search is interested in, is trying out lots of these possible designs and then simply selecting the best one experimentally. Let's look about this concern of uh, the downsampling scheme in networks. And the particular concern is about the information flow and the amount of information being preserved. When we downsample by a factor 2 spatially, so width and height is divided by 2, then we discard 75% of the information and we only keep 25% of the information. If we increase the number of channels by 2, then we increase the information by a factor 2. So somehow the idea is that in downsampling we would like to only reduce the information by a factor of 2 and not by a factor of 4. So what we're doing is we're downsampling by a factor 2 spatially and we're increasing the number of channels by a factor of 2. This is a pattern that has been used multiple times in architecture design. So let's look at this leftmost idea of downsampling. We start with 320 channels and after downsampling we have 640 channels. So twice as many. And the resolution, we start with 35 times 35 and here 17 times 17 is approximately half downsampling in width and height. But how do we get from this version to this. So you could do one pooling layer, so then you get to 17 times 17 times 320, and then you could do maybe a one by one convolution or or you can use actually a complete inception block to uh, get to 640 uh, channels 
and the same resolution. So, and then inception block is some of the blocks we discussed before. So what is the problem? Here we destroy 75% of the information or we reduce the information by 75% and then we add 50% back on here. And this scheme, of course, is inherently flawed because once the information is gone, we cannot invent it out of nothing. So we would like to have a slightly better flow of information. So why not maybe start by first doubling the number of channels? So when going from here to here, we can use an inception block, again, one of the blocks we discussed before, to go from 320 channels to 640 channels, but keeping the resolution the same. And then we do pooling to discard 75% of the information. But here we already increased by two. So the damage seems to be less and more of the information can be preserved. Now, in the solution shown on the right side, we see actually two different ways to depict the solution um, that the authors propose here. So the right, size, the right side, this part here, just shows the whole solution from the point of view of the grid sizes, the tensor sizes, and the left figure shows the solution in, from the point of view of computation. So let's look at the grid sizes first to the right. We start with a 35 times 35 times 320 tensor and we get to this 17 times 17 times 640 tensor. As desired, spatial resolution divided by 2, number of channels multiplied by 2. On the left branch here we have a convolution that is a convolutional block that uh, considers a tensor of 17 times 17 times 320 as output. And on the right, we have a pooling uh, operation that produces this 17 times 17 times 320 as output. And then these two tensors are concatenated to give us this output here. So uh, computationally, the pooling side is pretty easy, so we have this pool side 2 that gives us the pooling branch on the right side, but the computation of the convolution is again factored into multiple different convolutional layers. So first of all, there are kind of two branches, and uh, let's pick the middle one, we do one by one, and then a three by three stride three, 2 convolution. Again, this will downsample so the output here will be a 17 times 17 times something. We don't know because the two branches, so this branch here and this, the two convolutional branches, they will be concatenated. So the 320 channels will be split between these two branches. And then the leftmost branch here, we do one by one convolution, then three by three stride one convolution, and here three by three stride 2 convolution to do the actual downsampling. Some details. Um, the authors suggest to use the RMS prop optimizer, uh, factorized 5 by 5 and also the factorized 7 by 7 convolutions. Um, they use batch normalization in the auxiliary classifiers. As we saw before, they have these auxiliary classifiers. Label smoothing is used during training, and when we look at the table on the next slide, these are just some notes to consider, that is convolution with zero padding is marked, and zero padding is also used inside the inception modules that do not reduce the spatial resolution. So here is the table. On the right side, we see the input size, and here is here are some notes on the convolution used. Whenever the stride is 2, so here is the stride 2, stride 2, 
striat 2, we can observe that the image resolution is divided roughly by 2. What we see here then first are the spatial resolutions and the number of channels. And what we see is that this would be maybe the stem of the network, that is uh, the part that does this more or less aggressive downsampling before a lot of these inception computation happens. So uh, you see there are multiple conf layers that are, are involved to get the resolution from about 300 times 300 to 35 times 35. Then the main part of the network are these blocks. So block one, two, three, these were the three blocks we discussed before. So we have three times this inception block one, five times in inception block two, and two times inception block three. So at the end of all this, so this would is we get this type of eight by eight by 2048 tensor. And this 8 by 8 times 2048 tensor is simply put into a pooling layer where all these spatial pixels are more or less averaged, so or, or are averaged. So uh, now this is a massive simplification to what you remember from the VGG architecture. The VGG architecture had these really costly, fully connected layers at the end. And what you see here is only a single fully connected layer that operates only on this one by one by 2048 size vector. So that's a vector with 2048 dimensions. And these two previously very costly fully connected layers are simply replaced by a pooling operation. And this pooling has a spatial resolution of 8 by 8. So really, simply all these 8 by 8 pixels, each with 2048 dimensions, they are simply averaged. All right. So this is the inception architecture. Uh, version, this is the paper describing the inception version 2 and version 3 architecture. Further, the team looked at uh, creating another architecture, Inception 4.0 and Inception ResNet. Again, multiple architectures introduced in the same paper. And we can look at the paper for some of the architecture figures. So this is the paper, and uh, we'll just take a brief look at it. This is uh, some comment on previous work. So there's a part of STEM design, and then we see lots of different drawings for different blocks. More blocks, and more blocks, and uh, more architecture figures. Now, um, at this point in time, we're not going to look at all these details anymore, but I think it is somewhat possible to ask, like, where is all of this going? It seems that just manually designing these blocks and then uh, trying all of them out is uh, somewhat a direction that is not uh, very sustainable. So DanceNet contributed another significant idea in architecture design. The idea is the following. A simple chain network uses the output of one layer as the input to the next layer. So if we have L layers, then we have L connections between the layers. The DanceNet idea is to say that each layer takes all previous layers' outputs as input. So L layers have L times L plus 1 divided by 2 connections. So let's say we have 
10 layers, then the 10th layer takes the output of all 9 previous layers as input. This idea, of course, doesn't scale arbitrarily, because if we think of doing this with 100 layers, and the 100th layer then has 99 inputs, then the number of inputs just is way, way too much for the network to handle. So, of course, we will apply this similar to before, not in the way of uh, doing this all the way through the network, but in individual blocks where this type of dense connections, so that also explains the name DenseNet, are only done within one block, that is one architecture block, a DenseNet block, where you have these very dense connections. Here are some advantages the authors claim in their paper. First, there is a reduction of the vanishing gradient problem, similar to arguments from LSTM and arguments from ResNet. Uh, these connections should help the training. Then, feature propagation is strengthened, again because of all these dense connections. The network encourages feature reuse. The output of one layer is used as input for many other layers. Also, the number of parameters is reduced. And the way the authors designed the network, it in fact really has a very small number of parameters. And therefore, the performance, this high performance the authors could achieve, is all the more amazing and significant. Now, one difference to ResNet we should uh, highlight here is that the tensors are combined by concatenation and not element-wise addition. So these uh, shortcut branches, they will just um, be all of them, basically all these tensors that are input into one layer, they will be concatenated and not added together. So here is the architecture figure of DenseNet. What we see here in red is one tensor. So let's say this is the tensor X0. And this tensor has multiple channels. And each of these slices represents a channel. So in an abstract sense, I mean, we see six slices here. So let's say. Uh, of course, there will be a different number of, uh, possibly a different number of channels. So this is a hyperparameter of the architecture. So let's consider this as some abstract depiction. And then uh, what we see here is one computational layer that is a combination of batch norm, ReLU, and convolution. And what we have is that this tensor X0 is input into this first convolutional layer. And as output, we obtain the tensor x1. Again, we see this abstract representation of multiple channels of this tensor x1. Tensor x1 will be input to this convolutional layer. So I guess the authors call this h2. And as output, we obtain the tensor x2. X2, again, will be input to H3, and then it will be output. The output will be the tensor X3. Finally, X3 is input into H4, and as output, we obtain X4. Now, for the dense connections. The tensor X0 is not only input to H1 here, but it is also an input via this link here to H2, and via this link here to H3, and via this link here to H4, and via this link here to the transition layer directly. So what we see here in this block is that tensor X0 is used 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times as input. 
tensor x1 is used four times as input, once for h2, once for h3, once for h4, and also for the transition layer. The earlier a tensor appears in a dense net block, the more often it is used as input to other layers. As you can imagine, this is only feasible if this layer, if this uh, number of channels is not really, really high. So if we imagine that each of these tensors has uh, 256 channels, then uh, the transition layer will obtain quite a lot of uh, tensors with a high number of channels as input. So the DenseNet architecture doesn't only need to manage the number of layers in a block, because the more layers the input grows and grows, but also it needs to manage the number of channels so that uh, the amount of memory and data processed is not going to be too high. In this context, the authors introduced the concept of a growth rate k. So the growth rate k is the number of channels output by one of the convolutional layers. So the whole dense net block has a tensor with k0 channels as input, where k, k0 can be significantly higher as the growth rate k. And then the earth layer has k0 plus l minus 1 times k input channels. To manage this, the authors propose k equals 12, which is a modest number of channels. The convolutional layer does batch norm relu 3x3 three three convolution, maybe a bit uh, of an unconventional order. Transition layers reduce the spatial resolution of tensors and they are built by a batch norm layer, 1 by 1 convolution layer, and 2 by 2 average pooling layer. A bottleneck layer uses batch norm relu in conf 1 by 1, batch norm relu conf 3 by 3, instead of batch norm relu conf 3 by 3. Let's look at the final architecture. So uh, we see there are dense blocks, so dense block 1, dense block 2, dense block 3, and then the transition is done with convolution and pooling. And at the end, similar to before, we just pool all the pixels together with average pooling, and then we build a linear classifier on top of uh, the network output. So that means the network output of all the previous layers. So for this one, we just uh, introduced the main idea of these dense blocks, but for the architecture details, we just refer to the paper. So we'll just mention this here. This maybe doesn't really fit into this lecture, but the neural architecture search idea is to use other algorithms to search for a suitable architecture. People tried genetic algorithms, some other form of stochastic search, reinforcement learning uh, to find suitable architectures. So we'll discuss this. Squeeze and ExciteNet also introduced a building block that is uh, still interesting today. So the idea is to add a block that computes a per-channel scaling. So if we have a tensor of size c times width times height, where c is the number of channels, then we have one scalar per channel, and all values in one channel are multiplied with the same scalar. <clears throat> so what we need is some network block that first 
computes these C different scalars, one per channel. And this squeeze and excite block can be used after some operation, for example, convolution. So somewhere in this network, we have a tensor X. This is input to a layer FTR or a block FTR. That is some arbitrary transformation that takes a tensor X as input and outputs a tensor U. The squeeze and excite block is uh, this part shown here that will take this tensor u and transform it to another tensor x tilde, shown here to the right. So basically, the squeeze and excite block is a post-process that is used to post-process a tensor after it is output of a convolutional layer. The post-process consists of three steps. The first step is squeeze. Squeeze simply computes one average value per channel. This is similar to other normalization blocks that we have seen where first some channel average is computed. The tensor U has C channels and taking one average per channel gives us one times one times C as a vector. So we have C scalar values in this vector. Each channel again has H and W as width and height. So for each of these C average values, we are summing up width times height number of scalars and divide by width times height. So the equation is shown here at the bottom, but uh, this should be trivial at this point in time. What we see here in this double sum is we sum over width and height, and then we take the scalar value of the tensor at channel C and at pixel position i and j. And then up front here, we normalize, so we divide by the number of pixels in the channel. And this is performed once per channel C. So this vector Z subscript C has size as discussed one by one by C. Next, we'll do some excitement or uh, some mini network that is shown here. So this fx performs a, a transformation of this one by one by c average vector into another vector that has one scalar per channel. And this time this is a scalar that will give us the uh, multiplicative factor that each channel Will be multiplied by. So as input we have the average values per channel and as output we obtain a scalar value per channel that the output will be multiplied by. And then we have scale and at scale the channels will be multiplied individually. So we will defer the details of this excitement uh, part until later and just briefly discuss the scale part also because it is trivial. So what we see here is that each of these scalar values is color coded, one per channel. So if we look at this orange scalar, which is the last entry of this vector, then this will be used to scale the last channel. And this is shown here, last channel in orange. And then some of the middle channels, so we pick out this channel will be scaled by one scalar, which is denoted by this red value over here. So pick channel-wise scaling, again, is a trivial operation. 
but how about this uh, this uh, block f subscript x fx computes two one by one convolutions which is the same as two fully connected layers operating on a vector first so we have an input is a one by one times c tensor z and then the first output is one by one times c divided by r so there is some dimension reduction and then we go back to one by one by c which is a dimension expansion looking at this as uh, written out as an equation then we have fx is a function that takes this uh, parameters w as input so there will be two parameter matrices w as input one for each fully connected layer and z is the vector of averages that is also an input and then we compute first uh, fully connected layer first linear layer w1 times z relu w2 times the output of this and then sigmoid for the shapes of w1 and w2 we refer to this idea of dimension uh, reduction and dimension expansion discussed up there So squeeze and excite net is a building block and this building block can be put into multiple different networks. For example, into an inception network, inception architecture or a ResNet. Let's look at inception first. There would be some inception block that a sensor is X is input to and then as output of the inception block the, so the, the squeeze and the side block that would operate on the output of the inception block. So this is exactly what we discussed before. Now, global pooling is just another name for computing one average per channel. Then we have this fully connected layer, ReLU fully connected layer, exactly with the dimensions described before. So there would be first a dimension reduction, so the number of channels would be reduced to C divided by R after the fully connected layer and the ReLU, and then the dimension expansion again to 1 by 1 times C values. And then the final activation is the sigmoid. Then there is this scale block, and as output we get X tilde as shown on the previous figure. So this is almost a trivial extension or trivial combination of inception and uh, squeeze and excite block. But for the ResNet, there is some design choice. So in particular, we have some input tensor X that then goes into one of the res blocks. And so the question is, how exactly does the combination look like in the end? And so what we see is that uh, X again, there is the shortcut branch that goes and will be added after the squeeze and excite block does its work. And this part here again is just the squeeze and excite block that operates on the output of a block of the resonant. Now we arrive at uh, one of the best architectures that is known today, if not to say the best architecture that is known today, which is EfficientNet. So uh, EfficientNet is definitely one of my uh, most favorite architectures and uh, it is possible by using EfficientNet for something to really get higher performance in several cases than using some of the other architectures. So this is definitely true for image classification, but since these classification networks are used for back, as backbones for other problems, um, using EfficientNet for other types of problems is also highly recommended. As the name uh, also foretells, EfficientNet is one of these branches of architecture design that highly emphasize 
parameter efficiency. So the goal is still to build a network that is high performing even though it doesn't have a massive amount of parameters. The main idea of EfficientNet is to start with a small baseline architecture and then try to scale up this small baseline architecture. But how can we actually scale up an architecture? There are three possible ways to do so. We start out with a baseline architecture A shown here. So these different blocks here, these could be different uh, you know, blocks or different layers of the network. So maybe one of these colored boxes shows uh, a block and maybe these other rectangles show individual layers in a block. But uh, this is more of an abstract figure. So in this figure, the number of channels is denoted by the width of these rectangles. So as we see up here, number of channels, this is uh, the highest, so the highest number of channels for layers deeper in the network and earlier layers have fewer number of channels. So in the baseline, we also see that the uh, number of channels increases with the uh, depth of the network. So the further down we go in the network, the more channels per layer. Then the spatial resolution is denoted by the height of these individual boxes. So this one thing here denotes the spatial resolution. As we can see in this baseline architecture, the further down in the network we go, the spatial resolution decreases more and more. So in this layer up here, we have the smallest spatial resolution. All right, so the three ways to scale up are increase the width of the network, or what that means is increase the number of channels. What we could do is we could look at the baseline architecture, use a scaling factor, maybe what seems to be shown here is something uh, around two, and multiply the number of channels by two in each block. So now each of these blocks is about twice as uh, wide as the block of the baseline architecture. So each of these layers is multiplied or the number of channels is multiplied. Depth scaling refers to idea of making the network deeper. What we often see in architecture design that one block for example, a resonant block is repeated multiple times. Then there is some downsampling. Down then again, a block is repeated multiple times, some downsampling. All right, why not simply go into the network and repeat blocks more often? So in this abstract representation, in the baseline architecture, we had one such block, and now we have two such blocks. Same. Up here, we had one such block in the baseline architecture. Now we make it two such blocks. Another thing that can be used is resolution scaling. It helps if the network doesn't downsample so aggressively or it just downsamples later or even takes images of higher resolution as input. So what we can do is we can uh, keep the number of channels the same and the depth the same, but we increase the resolution. So now for each of these blocks here, we can see that they have a higher resolution than the baseline architecture. The argument of efficient net is that performing one of these scaling strategies in isolation does not work well. Experimentally, the authors argue that only compound scaling, that means using a coordinated scaling using all three strategies, is something that works, or is something that works uh, well. What happens 
if compound scaling is not used is that we see some form of diminishing return. So maybe we make the network wider. In the beginning, we get some improvement, but then we make it more wider and wider and wider and wider, and then the returns are diminishing and we can't really improve anymore. Also, just adding more layers doesn't help and also just increasing the resolution. It helps kind of in the beginning a bit, but then it saturates. So uh, the question then is, how can we do some sort of a coordinated com scaling where width scaling, depth scaling, and resolution scaling are well coordinated? So EfficientNet claims to produce a principal method to scale up convolutional networks. Let's assume we would like to scale up the network by a factor 2 to the power of n. Then we would like to determine constants alpha, beta, and gamma such that the depth increases by alpha to the power of n, width increases by beta to the power of n, and the resolution increases by gamma to the power of n. So let's simply discuss the baseline scaling, that is, we scale by a factor of 2, then the depth is scaled by alpha, width is scaled by beta, and resolution is scaled by gamma. How are we going to find alpha, beta, gamma? Well, we'll start with a small enough baseline model, and then we perform grid search. Grid search basically means that we'll try out uh, all possible combinations from a small enough set of combinations. So this, could, this is a particular form of brute force search. How are we going to find a baseline architecture? Well, for the baseline architecture, uh, we are going to use efficient net B0, and this baseline architecture is found using neural architecture search. So, um, loosely speaking, this baseline architecture is found by another brute force search method. But maybe not total brute force search, something slightly more elegant than brute force search. So um, what the paper proposes is to scale up the baseline architecture using these constants alpha, beta, gamma, as described here, alpha 1.2, beta 1.15, and gamma 1.1. There's one particular constraint that the paper proposes for the choice of alpha, beta, and gamma. The paper proposes to have alpha times beta square times gamma square to be approximately equal to 2. And the reason for that is that the flops scale linearly with depth, but quadratically with width and the resolution. Scaling up this baseline architecture efficient net B0 leads to many different versions of efficient net. And these, are, these versions are called efficient net B1 to efficient net B7. So there's B1, B2, B3, and so on. This table here shows the baseline architecture efficient net B0. So each row describes a stage, which is another term for a block, and each stage has multiple layers, which are uh, shown in the last column of this table. So, for example, this stage 4 has two different layers. 
the input resolution is shown here. So stage four has input resolution 56 times 56. And the number of output channels is denoted in this column 40 for stage four. The architecture uses a particular form of convolution that is called mobile inverted bottleneck or MBConf. And this uh, type of convolution is described in one of the mobile architecture papers. So if we have time later in the lecture, we might look at some of these mobile architectures as well. The main idea of this is to have a more uh, parameter efficient convolutional block. So you will see some of these <coughs> dimension reduction ideas also in this uh, mobile inverted bottleneck MBConf. Also, we still see that squeeze and excite blocks are being used. One thing that is interesting, maybe a bit crazy, is that due to the ability to compare to other work, this somewhat completely arbitrary starting resolution of images that AlexNet introduced in image classification still survived up until this day. Again, this is a very small resolution compared to the resolution that you would get from any camera or mobile device nowadays. Now, we're going to discuss something that is maybe more like a training recipe rather than an architecture detail, but nevertheless, I decided to put it at the end of this lecture. The idea is called fixing the train test resolution discrepancy. There are two papers to go with this. The first paper, fixing the train test resolution discrepancy, uh, discusses the general idea. And the second paper shows how to apply the idea to efficient net. If you look at architecture comparisons, you often see this prefix fix something, fix efficient net. This means that this idea fixing the train test resolution discrepancy has been applied to efficient net. We're going to introduce this idea only on a high level, an abstract level, and refer for the details to the paper. The thing that the authors observed is that typical um, training schemes, they apply some data augmentation and this data augmentation, in particular the cropping, leads to the fact that the network sees different resolutions at training time and test time. As example image, we see this horse image in the left. So um, here we have an example of a treatment of an image during train time. During training time, the data augmentation would perform a more aggressive cropping. So for example, it might crop the image focusing on this horse here to the right. And that means it would see a fairly small uh, part of the image. And then in order to hand off this part of the image, it would resize this image to the 224 image, uh, res uh, pixels, so it would create this 224 times 224 square. During test time, the most common method is to use the center crop. That means that the center of the image, some 224 times 224 crop here, will be used for testing. So when this is used, we'll see an image like this. And so um, what we can observe is that the horse in the test time crop and resizing is a lot smaller than the horse that is seen during training. 
So as solution, we either can make the uh, training images smaller, such as here, so that the white horse would occupy the same amount of pixel during training and testing, or we can make the test images larger as shown here. So if the test image is larger, then again the horse will occupy approximately the same number of pixels. That seems to be so trivial, trivial that it is hard that uh, time to believe this is even the topic of a paper. However, there are several details to this and that seems to make a really significant difference when comparing different architectures. So an architecture that does not use this trick, this is kind of more like a training trick, uh, has a significant disadvantage towards one that would use it. There's another detail that is that actually this resizing causes the activation statistics in the network to change. So to combat this side effect of this resizing, the authors propose some form of fine tuning of the last layer or last layers, I think it's only one, where after training happens, they still take maybe an existing network and uh, fine tune the last layers to uh, combat this change in activation statistics. All right. So these are two simple ideas explained on a high level that make a big difference. All right, let's look at some architectures in comparison. There are many different comparisons and we discussed different performance metrics. The dominant ones used now are just two number of parameters versus classification performance. Of course, computation is also interesting and we see uh, maybe other, of other metrics in conjunction with mobile networks. But for doing this overall performance, just this straightforward competition on ImageNet, a lot of the graphs that we see in recent papers just show number of parameters versus classification performance. Classification performance used to be top five performance. That means all top five guesses of the network counted to only top one. That means only one guess, the top guess of the network counts. So while the error rate that you see in the papers of VGG and ResNet, for example, is much, much uh, lower than what um, EfficientNet has, this is only the reason because uh, the metrics changed from top five to top one classification performance. In order to see some comparisons, we can go to uh, multiple websites that cannot track some form of ImageNet leaderboard. Let's first uh, look at some slides and copy uh, comparisons here. All right. So what we see on the x-axis is the number of parameters in millions. And on the up axis is ImageNet top one accuracy. And so what we can see is that the top network is EfficientNet B7. And EfficientNet B7 only has 60 million parameters, which is significantly less than what uh, VGG, the VGG network had. And the VGG network uh, doesn't even make it onto this figure. All right, I don't know why it's just left out or because it uh, has a performance less than 74. Okay. I mean, this figure is cut off here, so we have 74 to something like 80, 84, 85-ish of top one classification performance. It's good to keep these numbers in mind and remember what these numbers are uh, when reading other papers, since uh, this top one accuracy often comes up. All right, so 
uh, what we can see is that the efficient net numbers in general are very good. So even if you go for some small network, uh, maybe let's pick B4. This seems to be very attractive. It has, seems to still have less than 20 million parameters and it has excellent performance. By comparison, we see something like ResNet here. This is already 6% performance drop from uh, EfficientNet B7 and uh, DenseNet, what we discussed. Um, also, what we can see is it has really a few number of parameters. So even DenseNet 201 has only like 20 million compared to ResNet 152 has about 60 million. And here we see some Inception architectures, Inception v2, and uh, something like Inception ResNet v2, and what we discussed, ResNext. So there's the version ResNext 101. This is interesting here, Squeeze and ExciteNet. This had quite a lot of parameters, but the performance was also really good. And Squeeze and ExciteNet, I think this was an architecture that was done by a research lab and not by a major company. As you can imagine, architecture research uh, is not completely but uh, strongly in the hands of companies since it requires a very large amount of computational resources. You cannot have an idea and try it out. You need to have some sort of an idea for a search space, try many, many, many different versions of your idea, and then see if one of them works out well. And then fine-tuning the architectures to get every bit of performance out of it is also something that goes a lot easier with a lot of GPUs. So just telling you the efficient net idea, if you would try to implement it from scratch and uh, do something just reading the paper, you would end up with something that's very far off than what the fine-tuned version is that the authors propose, because it would take you a long time to figure out all the details of training, maybe even the learning grade schedule, uh, where exactly to put the normalization layers, um, and uh, how to configure these things, and maybe the, even what optimizer to use, and so on. All right, and then again, what is always nice to see, like ResNet 50, I would consider this is the baseline network for me, for almost anything. I consider this is more like the hello world network of image classification now, and this would be the standard, let's call it baseline backbone. I think it's just popular when people do some research, they just want to take one network off the shelf. Uh, often they pick ResNet 50. All right, before looking at some of the leaderboards, let's discuss some aspects that touched upon in this lecture. First, I would like to say that, at least it is my belief, that architecture is very, very important. This poses a challenge for research because state-of-the-art architectures can be very large. Constantly switching to state-of-the-art architectures is very difficult. So, for example, you did some work with ResNet 50 and then, you know, maybe uh, one year later, you have to dis switch to some uh, version of uh, Inception, and then one year later you have to switch to DenseNet, and then one year later you have to switch to Squeeze and ExciteNet, and then one year later you have to switch to EfficientNet. So uh, this is time consuming because often the architecture cannot be simply changed out, but it requires to adapt also a lot of other parts of what you're working on. Also, when you propose changes to small architectures, such as ResNet 50 or VGG16, you never really know if the change is really relevant. Maybe you have a great idea for doing architecture compression. 
you find a way to omit some layers that are not useful, you have some results on ResNet 50, there's no guarantee that any of this will work on EfficientNet. Then architecture ideas are relevant for all sub-problems. So somehow, strangely, or I mean, it somewhat makes sense why it is why it is, the architecture is typically developed separately for each sub-problem. So for example, segmentation networks develop their own architecture, depth estimation develop their own architecture, object recognition, own architecture, post segmentation, see the same again, uh, same, the, the post estimation papers, they continuously build upon their own architecture ideas. But then there is this uh, cross idea transfer that constantly new ideas from classification architectures influence each of these sub-communities and the sub-communities influence each other. That is somewhat undesirable because the same idea can be published multiple times or papers can just consist of combining architecture ideas from other papers. Also something that has uh, somewhat uh, been uh, an inconvenient truth for a lot of uh, mathematically inclined researchers is that the dominating fact of architecture is that it makes such a big difference, but it is highly experimental. So looking at the architecture papers, they use very little knowledge of uh, computer science or mathematics. A lot of it is just some system design and uh, very clever engineering, but it doesn't really have this very elegant, sophisticated mathematical touch to it. So uh, in some sense, people in research, they always wish for some intellectual competition where very sophisticated and very complicated ideas could be worked on, where there's some uh, highly complex intellectual barrier to enter the field and something like architecture research that is so experimental doesn't, or at least for several people, doesn't really count as very elegant or sophisticated research. However, in the end, what we can observe is that these architecture ideas have a huge impact in practice. It is hard to imagine uh, how significant the impact of something like AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, EfficientNet has been in practice and how many people have been touched by this research. One measuring stick, of course, also totally incomplete, is the vast number of citations that were uh, collected by these architecture papers. For example, ResNet, as of recording this re lecture, has been cited 56,000 times. This is a really high number. AlexNet uh, has been cited 70,000 times by now. Also a really high number. Finally, I would like to highlight this problem that I call ResNet 50 research, because in a university setting, uh, resources are limited and uh, often much more limited than you would like. So uh, it is often necessary to start with a baseline such as ResNet 50 and develop an idea from there. And this is done in many research communities and in many research papers. So baseline networks such as ResNet 50 is used and improvement over ResNet 50 is shown. But then it is impossible to say, will that really uh, scale up? Will this work for larger, um, larger networks or even larger data sets as often these ideas are then not 
shown on ImageNet or a large net, uh, large training set. So um, this is just uh, an observation. I'm not really offering a solution to this, but this is something to be aware of. So it depends on the research community and on the idea if this type of uh, research will be accepted. Some papers or some communities, uh, they can be accepted working only with a small baseline, but some type of ideas and uh, some type of communities, they really insist that results are shown on uh, large networks and large data sets. At least when starting out in research, it is important to consider the particular subfield one is working on, and one also has to be realistic based on what resources are available, uh, and this will uh, somewhat influence what type of research can be done. Now, let's look at uh, some of these leaderboards. Here we see papers with code that tracks the leader on ImageNet um, since 2011. There's some issue here though, that is uh, we have to consider that uh, these different leaderboards, they, um, you know, they slightly differ in the architectures they put out. And, and, and that you see here, they maybe also have slightly different results. And um, the, that, that makes a detailed comparison necessary when really looking at uh, the exact numbers and the exact architectures. Also, a lot of these architectures are architecture templates. So it's possible to uh, do many, many variations and different hyperparameters different training style for one and the same architecture, so things are not comparable. For example, uh, just as a, one example, it is possible to think of ImageNet as a smaller training set, even though it has 1 million plus images, and pre-train on a larger training set with 300 million images. So then an architecture that is pre-trained on this very large data set with 300 million images will perform better on ImageNet than one that hasn't been pre-trained. So then there might be the same architecture. Um, maybe it says ResNext something, but uh, maybe one architecture has been pre-trained, the other one has not, or one ResNext has been scaled up a bit in a certain way, uh, and so on and so forth. All right, so with this being said, uh, we start kind of deep learning era with AlexNet. And uh, so here we see that the top one accuracy was uh, between 60 and 70. There is ZFNet, which won the next year. Um, then discuss this, SPPNet. Let's go to VGG, uh, 19. Um, PreluNet, we didn't discuss. Inception, where's next? Okay, so there's not, not everything is shown here. So I think uh, GoogleNet or so is missing. So, you know, it's incomplete. ResNext, we discussed. Uh, DPN, didn't discuss. PNASNet, AmoebaMet, uh, we didn't discuss. So then you see, for example, there's some version change from ResNext 101 to um, what we see here, ResNext 101, uh, with some changed uh, parameters. All right, then again, fix ResNext. This is the idea of fixing the resolution discrepancy. And uh, Noisy Student will discuss a bit later. This is like a training uh, strategy that helps improve training, uses also very large uh, pre-training corpus. Uh, bit L we didn't discuss. And then at the end, we have fix efficient net L2. And this is a large version of efficient net that is larger than B7. So one important 
factor to consider is not only top one accuracy, but also the number of parameters. So what we see from efficient net L2 is not only this fixing the resolution discrepancy has been applied, but also someone went and made a really large network because B7 had under 100 million parameters and this version has close to 500 million parameters. All right, so here's the comparison. So 66 million parameters for fixed efficient net B7. All right, let's also look at this number here, 87.1 for fixed efficient net B7. This is this fixing trick. And let's go down to efficient net B7, 85. So this is a pretty big difference between um, using this uh, resolution discrepancy fix and not using it. All right, so let's go down maybe. So these are all pretty recent things. So we, we can go down by quite a bit, maybe um, try to find something like, uh, all right, try to find some resonance, okay. And, and so if you look at this, maybe again, so you, you see there's like tons of different res next versions, right? So um, let's just look for res next. So we see like 10 different versions. Let's just try res net. All right. So again, we see something like T res net XL. So these are all these uh, different types of versions. All right, let's go down. I don't know how far this goes down. All right, so you see that something like VGG is uh, moved quite far down the list. So 74% compared to 87, 88% of the current leader. Actually, let's double check what it was. All right, 88.5 for the current leader. Okay, let's go down again. Um, all right, I don't see AlexNet. Okay, but this is where we started. All right, AlexNet. So we see AlexNet, um, again, this is probably some version of AlexNet, and that one has 63.3 performance. So we definitely can see that architecture has come a very long way since AlexNet. Also, one important column is extra training data. So these networks have been pre-trained or they use some other form of data during training. So that means one would need to scroll down to have a separate competition for what's the best network that doesn't use any training data. And so then you, again, we see this is some version of efficient net. Let's look at one other sub such website, Sota Bench, and here um, we can see that uh, they have some other things, speed, images per second. All right, let's just look at the results in top one accuracy. So again, we see fixed efficient net L2 is leading, and uh, here you see just a lot more versions of this efficient net that show up. Um, again, we see ResNext, popular one, and uh, let's also go down. So this one might have a lot more networks because they allow so many versions of the same network. Um, all right. So here again, AlexNet is uh, pretty far down the list nowadays. But one important thing that's missing from this um, leaderboard, though, are the number of parameters. So that's a very critical thing to look at besides the performance. Okay, let's just try to look for something like efficient. Um, so kind of guessing that a lot of those stem from the efficient net paper, we can see that there are 248 entries on this leaderboard that are some form of derivative of efficient net. All right. Let's leave it at this for an introductory architecture le lecture. Um, other branches to look at is a branch of research 
in uh, neural architecture search and another branch of research is uh, concerned with mobile networks, networks that are particularly suited for